Wow. I, I, I got to say, thank you so much. This is really crazy. This is uh, pretty rowdy for a book event. I'd, <laughs> I, uh, I'm glad they saw my writer and brought a DJ, as I requested. Um, no, I didn't request that. That's really weird. Um, hello. Hi, Aziz. <laughs> uh, thank you for doing this. Thank you all for coming. Um, yeah, I'm excited to be here. Book con. Should we get? <laughs> should we get right into it here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are you gonna? Whatever. I, oh, he, DJ's gone. <laughs> what the fuck is this? I thought like after I gave a good answer, he'd go. Bah, 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 bah. <laughs> <laughs> I was really excited. Um, <laughs> all right, well. All right, we, on, we only have an hour. We only have an hour to talk, talk about love. Um, and we've got a lot of love to talk about. Sure. Um, how often do you see two guys talk about love for an hour? <laughs> no wonder so many people came. <laughs> And about halfway through this, this panel, uh, we'll have another, a third guy joining us. Um, and he's actually got a PhD. At least I think he does, right? He must. I, I believe so, yeah. <laughs> yes. So let's talk about this book. <laughs> he's just like a random doctor that we just <laughs> saw on the street. No, it's, uh, it's Eric Kleinenberg who, who wrote the book with me uh, and uh, helped me do the whole research project that went into uh, doing it. So that'll be fun when he comes out. Eric will be out here about halfway through. So Aziz, um, you know, I can see why at your age you would not write, you know, Aziz Ansari, A Life, or sure. the autobiography of Aziz Ansari, but why, um, why this book, um, and what makes you the person to do a book about love and relationships today? What, what sent you down this path? Um, well, you know, I do stand-up, and I was doing a lot of stand-up about um, dating and, and, and modern relationships, and it kind of started where I, I wrote this bit um, that, that came about because I, I met this girl that I really liked, and... Uh, I, and Tanya? We, Tanya, as, as she's <laughs> referred to in the book. Her, her real name is something else. Tanya's an alias. But um, <laughs> I met her, and it was like kind of a classic situation where... We hooked up this one night. I was really excited. I'm like, oh shit, me and Tanya, this is a thing. Oh my God, I'm so excited about me and Tanya, me and Tanya, me and Tanya are gonna go on vacation. Me and Tanya are gonna be a thing. This is gonna be great. And then I texted Tanya and then she didn't say shit back at all. <laughs> and, uh, I, and I was going crazy. I was like, what the fuck is this? Like just silence, just nothing, just nothing at all. Like we made out, we had this connection, like nothing, and, and I was really going crazy, and at one point yeah, I realized- but it, was, it was worse than that, because she, you saw the bubbles appear, that she was starting to respond, yeah. and then the bubbles disappeared. Yes, the bubbles disappeared, <laughs> and uh, oh yeah, that shit's never happened to anyone but me. <laughs> Get the fuck out of here, Oh no, shut up, don't do that noise. Uh, and yeah, it was like, it became this weird thing where I, I, she, she didn't write back, and then I would see she was like posting photos on Instagram and stuff. I'm like, what, you got time to post a photo of this deer you saw on your fucking hike, and you're not writing me back? What? And uh, so I started doing stand-up about it, and I realized like, oh, this, this seemed like a very personal thing, but it's actually very universal, and everyone has their own version of this, where, you, where you're going crazy because of stuff on your phone, and, and these are kind of problems you, you, you wouldn't even have, you know, 20, 30 years ago. It's all very unique to our time. And uh, then I started doing bits where uh, I, I was like, would look at people's real back and forth that they would have on their phone, and it was all really interesting. And at a certain point, I was like, oh, man, I, I bet there's a way to do an interesting book about this if, if I, like, talk to, 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 like, real academics and kind of ask them, like, well, why does the, the waiting, for example, drive people crazy? And I asked someone this who was, like, an m t professor, and um, she was explaining it to me, and I was like, wow, this is really fascinating. Well, this is why the waiting makes you go crazy. And I was like, oh, there's probably a bunch of things I can ask really smart people about and try to make a little more sense of it. And that was kind of the idea of the book, and that's kind of uh, what we pulled off. Uh, I can tell everybody that it works. This book is a book that everyone should read, uh, if you're looking for love especially. Um, so what is it about texting? Like, you know, I wish when I was young there, there was texting to be able to, you know, communicate with people more easily and with putting less at risk. But what is it 
that people get wrong so much? I mean, why is it so anxiety producing this, this communicating by text? And, and now, you know, there's a, you have a statistic in the book that uh, something like 67% of people would say yes to a prom invitation by text, yeah, which they, never would have happened before. Yeah, I mean, uh, younger people are way more comfortable with text and way less comfortable with phone calls. So we would do, for the book, we would do these big uh, group interviews, focus groups with people, and we would ask them, like, okay, well, would you prefer, um, you know, we'd have a bunch of women, we'd say, would you prefer if, uh, if a guy texted you or, or called you? And, um, you know, the younger people, whenever you propose the idea of a phone call, they're like, what? A phone call? Are you fucking kidding me? No. Why? Why would I want to talk to somebody on the phone? And it was terrifying to them, the idea of having to have this spontaneous conversation uh, where you, you, you had to kind of be on your feet and think of stuff. They were much more used to um, text messaging and Facebook messaging where you have a minute to gather your thoughts and figure out what you're going to say. And, uh, you know, one of the ideas we talk about in the book is the idea that, like, oh, if, if people are doing that kind of communication more and more, and, and I read a thing not long ago that for uh, younger people now texting has surpassed even face-to-face -face interaction as their most yeah. common way of Believe communicating. It, yeah. yeah, so it's the idea is like, well, are those muscles in their brain um, not getting enough exercise so they're horrible at, at talking to people and uh, when I meet young people on the street I believe that it is true because <laughs> 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 they're just like, uh... <laughs> Can I take a photo of your face and then walk away? And then when you meet older people, they'll have a conversation with you. But um, it's a weird medium for romance because it has that anxiety. And like you're used to kind of uh, sending a message and receiving a response. And your brain has been trained to get that kind of, oh, here's a thing. Ah, oh, here's a positive response. And when you don't get it, your brain's like, well, what's going on? Where, where, where is that other part of the message? And then when you're dealing it, with it in a romantic context, I, you know, I've even dealt with it even, I'm in a relationship, like a loving relationship with someone. It'll be about two years. But if I'm texting back and forth with my girlfriend and then uh, she doesn't write back for like, if we're, she's writing back right away. And then there's like a 30 minute break where she doesn't write back. I'm like, oh shit, she's pissed about something. What happened? What happened? What did I do? I fucked up something. She found something. Something bad. Something horrible has happened. <laughs> and uh, it, it is a, it's a medium that makes you nervous. And and what are people when they are texting, d despite you know waiting for an answer? Um, why do they act like idiots? I mean, when they do, you've seen a lot of these in um, in performances. Yeah. Well, the thing is, why I think they a lot talk of like they talk and would talk in person. Well, I think a lot of people they don't realize. Uh, you know what was super interesting was we'd have a room full of women and we would uh, ask them like, hey, um, what are kind of the, 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 the first texts you get from guys? Like what do guys used to say? And it's always just like, hey, <laughs> what's up? <laughs> what are you doing tonight? You doing anything? What's going on? And if you're a guy sending that, it seems pretty harmless, right? Like you're not saying anything bad, it seems pretty innocuous. But in the context of a woman's phone where there's all these idiots saying stuff like that, you, you look very boring. And uh, so we would say like, well, what are things you like? And after interviewing a bunch of women, um, the kind of consensus we got was like, if you're a guy and you just ask a woman to do a specific thing at a specific time, just that alone just makes women's vaginas go insane. Um, <laughs> like that alone, like uh, girls be like, what? Like actually inviting me to do something? Oh my God, that would be the most amazing thing ever. And then if you, on top of that, if you add like a little bit of humor or some callback to like a previous interaction to show you actually care about this person and think they're special, it really like w was a game changing thing. And if you think about it, that's such a simple, polite thing, but I think, you know, guys a lot of time are nervous and they're just like, hey, what's going on? And so they come off probably dumber than they really are, you know? Um, let's have a concrete example and give you guys a sample of this book. Um, I'm going to ask Aziz to read uh, one page of the book, which is about um, just this kind of bozo. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. So, so in this passage, it's about how I, I read someone's phone um, at a show in Chicago, um, and I talk about looking at their text messages on their phone. Um, at this particular show, I was speaking with Rachel, who had met a guy at a good friend's wedding. As it happened, the guy was also a friend of her sister's, so he had a pretty good shot at a first date with her. She was single, she was interested, 
All he had to do was send her a simple message introducing himself and asking her to do something. Here's what happened. He sends his first message. Hi, Rachel. Since I never got a chance to ask you to dance at Marissa and Chris's wedding, I'm Chris's old roommate from Purdue, he and your sister gave me your number. I wanted to say hi and sort of texty introduce myself, haha. <laughs> Hope you had a great weekend, dot, dot, dot. Hope to chat with you soon. As soon as I said texty, it was clear that no one sitting in the 3,600-seat Chicago theater would ever fuck this dude in a million years. <laughs> texty, for whatever reason, seemed to be unequivocally disgusting to every one of us there. He may as well have added, by the way, I have a really disgusting next-level STD, ha ha. But for real, I do. Rachel wrote back 10 minutes later, hey, great to meet you, smiley face, currently enjoying my birthday weekend with lots of good Mexican food. It happens when your birthday is Cinco de Mayo. Hope you had a great weekend too. Will wrote back shortly, I totally realized upon reading my last message, I didn't include my name. Ha ha ha, I'm Will, smiley face, Feliz Cumpleaños as well. <laughs> and totally digging on the Cinco de Mayo theme. <laughs> Rachel never met Will. <laughs> After a few messages of this nature, Rachel stopped responding. None of us know Will. He may be a kind, handsome man with a heart of gold, but all we have to go on is those messages. And those messages have shaped in our minds a very dorky, terrifyingly Caucasian weirdo. <laughs> okay, I have one more question about texting that uh, you may not be able to answer, but I'll ask it anyway. So, and, and you faced this dilemma in your exchange with Tanya. Sure. And that was, you, you wondered when she didn't respond, you'd just written hey with one Y. Oh, and, yeah, yeah. And then you went back and thought, Maybe I should have written hey with two Y's. Yeah, sure. Because it's a completely different meaning, I guess. But yeah, of course. Do you know where little... that line is between adding another Y or maybe several more Y's? I, I don't know. I mean, I feel like if you have like 10 Y's, that's probably too many Y's. <laughs> um, but that's, you know, that's a thing that everyone does. You know, when we talk to people, they talk about how they would draft a text message and show it to their friends, and, and, and then they would send it, and then when they didn't get a response, they'd be like, fuck, I should have said this, I should have did that. What was I thinking? Ah! <laughs> and it is a very uh, common plight. But... To me, like, what's interesting is, like, all right, that thing that I sent with Tanya, I don't think I really fucked up anything in the text message, you know? The, the, I, I didn't do anything that screwed that up. Mm -hmm. But that dude, what the dude we just read, my, my point with that thing is, like, there's some people that are like, well, it doesn't matter uh, what you say to someone on text. If they like you, they like you. They'll get back to you if they like you. And it's such bullshit, because if you say text to introduce yourself, you're done. Like, there's no question. Um, okay, we're going we're gonna to move on to our next topic, uh, which is uh, how we meet people these days. Um, in the book, you talked about a study that I just found fascinating from 1932 in Philadelphia, where they looked at how uh, 5,000 marriages originated. And they found that of these 5,000 couples, one-third of the couples had lived within five blocks of each other. One in six had lived on the same block. One in eight couples had lived in the same building. Only 35% of the couples had lived beyond 20 blocks from each other of these 5,000 married couples. Um, you know, these days we aren't restricted by geography. It's, it's wide open. Um, so what, how, does that, how does that amount of choice impact and maybe be, you know, turn into a bad thing in terms of finding someone? Uh, I mean, that is a big question in the book. Uh, right now, I think the, one of the biggest changes for people that are trying to meet someone now is we have more choice than ever before. Whenever you talk to these older generations, they, uh, when we went to retirement homes and interviewed people, they would always be like, oh, I, uh, he was a guy that lived in the neighborhood, he lived across the street, he lived in my building. And now, you know, that's never the case. Crazy. You never hear that. I mean, I, I couldn't imagine dating any of the fools that I knew. <laughs> 
<laughs> living with me in Bennettsville, South Carolina, where I grew up. You, you meet, everyone meets people in all these different places, and then online dating. So basically, we have the most amount of choice ever. We have more options than any generation of people ever. And that's, it seems like, oh, that's a great thing, right? Um, and on one hand, it kind of is, but on the other hand, it's kind of terrifying, because, you know, whenever you look at studies about choice and decision making, every time it's kind of shown that um, the more options we have, uh, the harder it is to make a choice, and the less satisfied we are when we do make the choice, because we're scared we maybe didn't make the right decision. And, and I think that's what's happening with, uh, with, with young people now. It's, you feel kind of overwhelmed by how many options there are. You, you go online and- In your pocket, right? Yeah, you, you know, as we say in the book, it's like if you have a cell phone, you basically have a 24 seven singles bar in your pocket at all times. I mean, that's <laughs> pretty much what it is. So um, I think there's a good and a bad uh, with that. And it can be definitely terrifying. And uh, so what mistakes do you find that people make in, in online dating? Or how should people be using online dating? This is a question that I hear all the time. Like, sure. what is the right way to, to navigate this world? And, and uh, Helen Fisher had some interesting things to say about that, too. Yes. Like limiting, you know, getting to meet people quickly and that sort of thing. Yeah, I, I think our big takeaway from all the talk we did about online dating is well, one thing a lot of people would say about online dating is, like, it's exhausting. That's what everyone kept saying. It's exhausting. You come home, there's this big thing of messages. You've got to answer all these messages, and then um, you're messaging all these people and blah, blah, blah. And ultimately, the people that were really happy with online dating were people that just spent less time on the screen trying to find this perfect person and more time actually meeting people. Uh, and, and, and I think it was Helen who said this great thing, I thought, which is uh, they shouldn't call it online dating. It should be called online introduction services because... That's what it is. It's about finding someone that you meet in person and seeing if you have that spark with them in real life. You know, uh, someone someone asked me uh, when I was doing an interview for the book a few weeks ago. They're like, "All right, if you could search for anything on an online dating website, like what would be the thing you would search if you were trying to find someone?" And I was like, "I would probably search. If I could search anything, I would search um, for a thing that says uh, someone who, when I sit around with them and watch three to five hours of a critically acclaimed drama and then do nothing all day, it's the most fun ever. Like that's, cause that's really what you want, right? Like it doesn't matter what color their fucking hair is, like that, you, you want that, you want that amazing thing. And you're never gonna be able to find that messaging someone over and over. You have to like spend time with them in person. And, and that was kind of my big takeaway from all our interviews on online dating. The people that were happiest were the ones that did less of the online part and more of the, the dating part mm -hmm. of it. And, and what about Tinder, which, which a lot of people criticize for being too shallow, too much just about photographs and, and images? Sure. What do you think? I, I think that's a really cynical way of viewing it. I mean, if you meet someone at a bar or anything, what are you doing? You see their face and you're like, okay, I, I, that face feels good when I look at it. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna go up to that face and, and, and engage with it. That's all you're doing and that's all Tinder is. You're just swiping right and then, you know, you, that's the same thing as seeing someone and, you know, basically it's like when you see someone at a bar, you're swiping right on their face when, when you go up to them. So to me, it's the same thing. Um, you talk a lot of, in, in, toward the uh, end of this book about marriage and long-term relationships um, and how, you know, I don't think most people realize how dramatically marriage and long-term relationships have changed in sh such a short amount of time, and you guys spell it out in the book really well. Um, so let's talk about what, what do we expect from marriage, and uh, let's begin um, with your parents. Um, who had an arranged marriage, yep. and you know, what did they think marriage should be, and what did it turn out to be for them? Well, uh, I think my parents, you know, my parents had an arranged marriage, um, and, uh, and you know, I talked to my dad about what that was like, and he said, like, well, I was a certain age, I was ready to get married, and uh, I went and met uh, a couple of women, and, and then, you know, decided on your mom. I was like, how many women did you meet? And he said, two. And I was like, <laughs> two, that's it? And I was like, what was wrong with, with the first lady? And uh, he was like, oh, she was a little bit too tall. And uh, <laughs> then he met my mom. She was uh, a little bit shorter than him. He was like, let's do this. And, uh, and, and, and they got married. And um, what, what age were they? 
my dad was like uh, 31 and my mom was 25, I believe. So that's late, later. Yeah, it's was... a little bit later, yeah. Um, but uh, he's a doctor and he was going through a lot of medical school and everything, so I think that's probably why he got married a little bit later. But anyway, they got married and, um, you know, I think uh, their marriage was kind of the best case version of arranged marriages. And arranged marriages that work, it kind of goes on this idea of like, oh, it starts at a simmer and it builds to a boil. As, uh, as, as, as the relationship progresses, you know? And I'd say my parents are at a boil now. They have a great time together. They seem like really in love and everything seems great. And, you know, now, uh, you know, for, for, for people that are trying to get married here, like you're trying to find like boiling water right away and you have no interest in pursuing it unless it's like boiling from the get go. And uh, what's interesting though is like even outside of arranged marriages, when we talk to these older people in the retirement homes, it sounded very similar yeah, yeah. to arranged marriage in a way. They, they, they would meet someone that lived in their neighborhood, they would date him for like six months, um, they would marry them, they'd they have seemed kids. good enough, right? It's like, yeah, the yeah. idea was the good enough marriage is what, uh, what people would call it, the good, good enough. And, and I think the difference is, back then, the idea of getting married was like, well, I gotta find a decent person who I can start a family with, you know, just, you know, someone that'll be a good person to raise a family with that's a good person. So, you know, the family would meet the guy and be like, all right, he doesn't seem like he's going to murder anybody. Um, <laughs> yeah, get married to him. They get married. And it was your first step in, in adulthood. And when we talked to these women, it was so interesting. They're like, yeah, I was 20 years old and I couldn't leave my house. I, I wasn't able to have like the basic freedoms of adulthood. I'd have to tell my mom wherever I was going, and the only way to get out was to get married and get on my own. And so we asked him, like, do you think you got married just so you could kind of just have those basic adult freedoms? And all of them were like, yeah. <laughs> and, and now that's totally Now it's the end of freedom. Huh? Yeah, now, it's, <laughs> uh, now you have this whole period where, where you're an adult, not living with your parents, where you're independent, and then at the end, you, you know, towards the later stage, you get married and, and start a family and everything. So here, here's what marriage has turned into, and, and Aziz quote, and Eric quote, uh, the psychotherapist Esther Perel, in describing what marriage has, has become, and I'd just like to, to read just a paragraph that, um, that pretty much says it. Marriage was an economic institution in which you were given a partnership for life in terms of children and social status and succession and companionship. But now we want our partner to give us all of those things, but in addition, I want you to be my best friend, my trusted confidant, my passionate lover to boot, and we live twice as long. So we come to one person, and we basically are asking them to give us what once an entire village used to provide. Give me belonging, give me identity, give me continuity, but give me transcendence and mystery and awe all in one. Give me comfort, give me edge, give me novelty, give me familiarity, give me predictability, Give me surprise. Is this what your um, husband or wife does for you? <laughs> Esther's husband is <laughs> like, oh, fuck. <laughs> oh, God, Esther, please. <laughs> so that's marriage today. Are, are we asking too, too much of marriage today? It's hard. I mean, I, I, the book kind of stops at, at kind of marriage and stuff and doesn't go too deep into that because me personally, I, I, I haven't gone into it enough to kind of comment on it, you know. Um, I've been with someone for like two years and even that's, it's, it's hard, it's tough because, you know, what I've kind of discovered um, in my relationship is like, you know, two years isn't a long time, but I do think it seems like it's the zone where the relationship changes in a little bit where I feel like the beginning of a relationship is you're just fucking and having fun. Like that's all the beginning of a relationship is. But then like two years in is when you have to start dealing with more serious life issues and it's like, all right, well, we got to lay down a structural foundation to maintain the fucking and having fun. Right. Uh, yeah, like what I've been saying, I've been, I've been trying to write a stand-up bit about this kind of, this like the idea would be like the, the, the beginning of a relationship is like, um, like the first episode of a new season of the real world. Uh, <laughs> where you walk in, you're like, holy shit, look at this house. There's all these rooms. Oh my God, there's a pool table in every room. It used to be a firehouse. This is so quirky. And then two years into a relationship is like that episode of The Real World where the producers are like, yeah, um, we think you guys should run a juice store as well. <laughs> and you're like, oh, shit. Uh, I guess we got to do this juice store thing as well. So I, I think it becomes hard. So, you know, I think with a, a long thing like a marriage, a long relationship, I don't know what the trick is to kind of provide all those things. I, I think it's hard. And um, maybe that'll be book two. We'll see. So I was, I was inspired by you guys. Um, 
in the research you did, uh, but we, one thing you didn't cover is what the younger generation thinks of marriage, and I'm talking about uh, roughly eight to 10 year olds. Sure. Um, so I did some research myself online and found an article where someone had asked children that age how we find the right person to marry. Um, here's what Alan, age 10, had to say. You've got to find somebody who likes the same stuff. Like, if you like sports, she should like sports. <laughs> and she should keep the chips and dip coming. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> um, and Kristen, also age 10, said, no person really decides before they grow up who they're going to marry. God decides it all way before, and you find out later, <laughs> and you find out later who you're stuck with. <laughs> Whoa. So last couple of questions before we bring Eric out. Um, when are you going to get married? When am I going to get married? I, I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't know if I ever will. I'm not, I, don't, I, I don't know. I don't really think about it. <laughs> I don't think I need and to be married. Like, and do you want that's kids? not like a slide against my girlfriend or anything. I'm just saying, like, I, I, I don't know if I need to like get married and have a and big party. You don't have something in your mind, or you think, oh, a certain age, whatever. No, I, I, you know, I think those kind of things are weird. I think trying to say like, oh, well, at this age, right. I'll do this or that. You know, I think, I think with like marriage and kids and all that stuff, I don't really think about it. And I figure like, at a certain point, I'll get bored of whatever I'm doing, and maybe I'll want those things, or maybe obvious. I won't. We'll see. Yeah. Good. All right. Um, we're going to welcome Eric Kleinenberg to the stage. Um, Eric is a professor of sociology at New York University. He's the author of Going Solo and has contributed to The New Yorker, Rolling Stone, and This American Life. And he wrote this and researched this book with Aziz. Uh, please welcome Eric. the biggest round of applause a sociologist has ever gotten. <laughs> <laughs> it's a shame that DJ wasn't here to play like some DJ Khaled song from when you came out or something. He left. Left us. All right, now we got Thanks, Bukhan. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's already here now, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All I do is win, 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 no matter what. There we go. That was quick. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. DJ Freefall. <laughs> All right, we've got, we've got the PhD on the stage. It's time, time for real answers. Um, so how, how did Aziz, first of all, just, you know, how did he rope you into this project? What did he, how did he find you? What did he say to you? And why did you think, yeah, that's a good idea? So um, the story actually starts with a Manny. Uh, I had a Manny, I have two young kids. And I had- Do you wanna define that? I, I'm about to, I, I live <laughs> in New York City. And so when you live in New York City and you're looking for childcare, you can get the most amazing people to take care of your children who have just incredible skills. So this guy um, was a playwright and a stand-up comedian uh, eventually a TV writer, uh, and he was taking care of my children who were totally in love with him. And you know, he'd put them to bed and we'd just hang out with him because we'd reached that stage in marriage where it was like fun to have more people in the room making us laugh. <laughs> um, so, um, so at some point he's like, oh man, you've got to like, listen to this comedian as he's Ansari. He's the funniest person in the world. And he started like playing us little clips, you know, MP3s on his phone. And we loved him and we're watching Aziz stand-up routines. And I'd just been, you know, kind of a, a fan. So I was in New York for a conference. I had written this book called Going Solo, which is about the fact that there's more single people in the world than ever before. And I'd written it with a Penguin Press. Uh, and I was, you know, standing with two grocery bags uh, and a train station one day. Uh, and Scott Moyers, our editor and the publisher at Penguin, um, you know, rang me up out of nowhere and said, hey, Eric, quick question for you. Sorry to, to uh, call it the blue, but have you heard of Aziz Ansari? And I was like, Aziz Ansari is my hero, uh, <laughs> which was totally not the response he was uh, expecting. Um, 
And he said, look, you know, he's actually, that's great news because he's sitting in my office right now. Uh, he, he's doing a book with us. Uh, he's really interested in working with a social scientist. Uh, and we wonder if you'd have a conversation with him. So I had to call my wife and get permission to not come home. I was going upstate. It was a couple hours away. I had all the groceries, like, for the dinner. Um, and, she, and you know how, every, like, in some marriages, you have, like, a couple people you can kind of break the rules with? So, like, it wasn't exactly that. Uh, <laughs> but it was, he's just, like, shifting over on the couch. But, but, <laughs> but we definitely knew that, you know, I, I was totally confident she was going to let me go. So I, like, I got the okay, dropped the groceries off at my mother-in-law's, went down to Penguin, and it was just like one of those conversations where it clicked and we felt like... What did, he, we, what did he say he wanted to do? He wanted to write a book about modern romance that was sociological, um, that, that really kind of generated new data, uh, and that took seriously the science of how people connect today, given the fact that like between every relationship and every kind of emerging relationship, there's this. Uh -huh. And this is like this huge force, and he wanted to know what that was about. And I, I have to admit, I didn't totally get it at first. Like, I was doing that lame thing you do when you're around a really funny person of trying to be funny myself, which <laughs> did not work at all. But then finally, like, it clicked, you know? Like, he actually wanted to get serious scientific answers to these really difficult and new questions, right. and that sounded like a lot of fun. And so, so take us through um, from that early discussion. Um, you guys did incredible work. I mean, travel to other countries and, and ar arranging focus groups, looking at a lot of people's cell phones <laughs> that they volunteered. So um, how did you conceive? You know, when, at what point did you decide, we're really going to take this global, where you decided to go, all those sorts of things. Um, how, how did that evolve? So, so honestly, uh, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong about this, but I think like all research projects, it starts with just like a lot of conversations that just kind of Questions. go on for hours and you're brainstorming, you know, thinking about your own experiences, like talking to friends, trying to, trying to get at the questions that we couldn't answer already, right? Mm -hmm. And we started, I think we did some like early focus groups with just very small numbers of people uh, in New York City and we would get even more questions. Uh, and it, it took like three or four months, I think, to, to really get a solid sense of what we were going to do. Um, and there, there was a lot of low-hanging fruit because these are very new questions. I mean, like, we all know that th these phones that we carry with us wherever we go are changing the way we interact with people, right? Like, whether we're single or we're married or in a relationship, like, the phones are part of our relationships in all kinds of new and confusing ways. And there's some people out there who are like, this is the end of conversation. No one's ever going to talk to another live human being again. We're just going to be with our phones. And there are other people who are like, no one will ever feel lonely anymore. And I think like one way we really connected early is we both felt like those are pretty extreme positions. And a lot of us are just kind of like swimming in this middle ground trying to figure out what to do. So we would kind of lock into certain questions that were interesting and then go for it. And you mentioned this thing about the, the data. I mean, I have to say, so, so I actually am like a trained social scientist. You know, I spend most of my time doing academic research and, and teaching and writing. And one of the hard things about being a social scientist is you're trying to get data, right? You're trying to produce data and get really reliable information. And th that's, that's hard to do. But we had this incredible uh, ability to get information I think no one's ever gotten. And that is that, uh, like, if you're a random social scientist and you go ask someone about their dating life, they're going to be pretty distrustful and a little, you know, uh, conservative in their answers. You're not going to get everything you want. People know Aziz from his stand-up and feel comfortable with him. It's like people want to talk to him. And so, like people would actually hand us their cell phones and be like, we'd ask like, have you met anybody? And have you had any exchanges with text messages? And people were like, oh, here, look. And we'd scroll up and down on their phones and it was incredible. And like, can you talk about this thing in LA with the online dating thing? Um, what was it? Oh, the, the yeah. The, uh, the, oh yeah, yeah. The, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we went, we did, a sh we did like this thing at the UCB Theater in LA where we were like, well, we want to learn about online dating. And so we, we said, all right, well, let's, let's bring a woman on stage and, and just ha like we'll hook up a computer and we'll have them like log on to their OkCupid account. And Eric's like, no one will ever do that. And I was like, yeah, they'll do it. And uh, <laughs> so we hooked up the computer and 
this woman logged into her OkCupid profile and you saw her inbox. And there was just like hundreds of like unread messages. It's on a screen? That yeah, it's on a screen. So you would see it behind us. And there's just like, she's just scrolling. She's like, yeah, these are all messages I haven't responded to. I mean, I just don't have the time. I'll probably just delete most of these. And then the guy's like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> And it was, it was unbelievable because it's like, you know, it's one thing to hear someone talk about this stuff, but to see their actual inbox and see the kind of stuff that people were sending them, it, it was incredible. I mean, that was the most, the, the, of all, like, the research and stuff we've done, talking to the experts, like, reading studies, the most eye-opening thing was people's real experiences. The, the first thing we did where we had, like, um, people in a room and asked them to give us their cell phones, um, I was like, has anyone texted someone? And this woman was like, oh, I have. And I was like, well, can I see the back and forth? And I looked, and, and right away I was like, all right, well, the guy's name is Eric, don't text till Thursday? That's strange. <laughs> and she was like, oh, yeah, I'm trying not to come off ogre eager, so I put don't text till Thursday. And, <laughs> and I was like, that's so crazy that she's like, okay, his last name is don't text till Thursday. That means I can't write him. It's Wednesday. I can't, don't, do not do this. And... Um, yeah, like whenever you saw people's real things, you would just get a whole other glimpse into things that because that you wouldn't get otherwise. And um, yeah, that, that was that was really interesting. So, so like this is amazing scientifically, just because we're deeper into people's real experiences than you can normally get, right? Like if you're doing interviews with people, you always have to worry about this problem that people don't have a perfect memory of what they've done, or that they're not going to tell you the full story. Other than the NSA, I don't think anyone has gotten inside people's phones like the way we have over the last few months. Yeah, because if you ask someone like, oh, what happened with that guy? Well, he texted me and then I, 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 you know, it just kind of fizzled. But then you look at the real message and it's like, hey, let me text to introduce myself. <laughs> Feliz cumpleaños. And you're like, what the fuck is this? I mean, that's totally more interesting. It's totally more real. And no one remembers those kind of details. But every single person has, like... Every single text message like that is interesting and weird in its own way. It's such a real thing, and it's such a confusing, strange part of a relationship. It's always very fascinating. So, so were there some, I mean, these are, these are all sort of funny examples, but were there some real emotional moments that you guys came across on people's phones where it was, like, painful and uncomfortable? And <laughs> yeah, there, you remember, there was one dude in L.A. We were looking at his messages, and it was just, it was just so clear this person wasn't interested in him, and he just kept going, and we just kept reading it, and we're like, oh, dude, you gotta stop saying stuff to this person. <laughs> and he's like, oh, I, I said a couple more things. <laughs> we're like, oh, no. But uh, usually, it's, it's usually like the beginning of it is this very kind of awkward, fun thing, and it's not as, as uh, emotionally charged, except for like, you know, what I described with the Tanya thing, where people would get frustrated or something, but um, it was never like super depressing or anything, except for that one dude. It was a little sad. <laughs> well, I mean, I would say, say another thing also on that, and, and it's that, you know, but because of the nature of these devices that we like, we hold them in front of us, we generally don't share them with people other than very close friends if we're trying to like do a text message. We experience like all the interaction we have as this like very private personal thing, right? Like we all have these, we, we started talking about the phone self that all of us have, which, we've, which is really pretty developed, but very few of us have any idea that other people are going through the exact same shit, you know, all the time. And I would say like, we talked to hundreds of people, like we did small focus groups, we did one-on-one -on -one interviews, we did focus groups with a couple hundred people in countries all over the world, and it is remarkable how many of us are going through the exact same kind of thing and like struggling to answer, like, what do you write in a message? Like, when is someone interested in us? When is someone not interested in us? Like, do I text? Do I Facebook? Do I call? And the feeling that came out of so many of these rooms, I'd say every room was like this kind of we're all in it together mm -hmm. thing, which like as a sociologist is, is amazing. Like there's this collective experience that we are all having, that we are experiencing as our own personal problems. And what's like so amazing about this set of things we're able to do is like we could learn about it and also laugh at ourselves. And you just don't get to do that very often. I have to tell you guys, there's a, there's a great screenshot that um, these guys include in their book of some guy's phone, and he's, he's trying to, you know, hook up with some woman who he's never met, I guess, but it's just on her phone, you sort of forget if you're texting someone each day, you think it's like individual text, but this screenshot of the phone, it's like Saturday, hey, Sunday, hey, Monday, hey, 
Tuesday, hey, Wednesday. And then finally the last one, after a full week of this, he writes, hey, and he adds the second Y to, to the hey. And then they had sex the next day. <laughs> yeah, it's just people acting nuts, you know? They get a phone and they go nuts. Um, so uh, one last thing about this, this research. Um, th so these guys went to other countries and um, picked Japan as one of these countries. And there, there are several statistics that I just want to read about what's happening in Japan. These were, this was just sort of mind-blowing to me. It's not something I was aware of. Um, and I want to ask you guys to comment on it more. 45% of Japanese women aged 16 to 24 quote, were not interested in or despised sexual contact, end quote. And more than a quarter of Japanese men that age felt the same way. Second, one third of Japanese people under 30 have never dated. A survey of those between 35 and 39 found that more than 25% had never had sex. As a result of all this, maybe, Japan's birth rate is declining so dramatically that if current trends hold, by 2060, the number of Japanese will have fallen from 127 million to 87 million. So what's, what's the deal in Japan? <laughs> uh, we made all those numbers up. <laughs> we went to Japan. Yeah, and I saw citations so. in the back of the book. Yeah, no, uh, that, that was really, those are some crazy fucking numbers. I mean, despise. Sexual what? contact. What? That's like, <laughs> you see boobs, you're like, ugh, <laughs> get them away, I despise those. <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, the, the stuff in Japan, it's, it, you know, we were reading these articles where it's like, it's a crisis. You know, the government, I mean, that number about the drop, it, they're, they're worried about Japanese people running out. Like, the government is stepping in the and funding investing. funding dating, right? And, yeah. yeah, and investing in creating programs to help people meet and mingle. And um, so we went there, and we interviewed all these people there. We had this woman who was a sociologist there translate for us, and we spoke to all these Japanese people. And again, like, it's one thing to kind of see these numbers, but when you talk to the actual people, you get a much bigger sense of, of, of what's going on there. And, and it's, it's, such, it's such a strange thing. Um, you know, there, there's kind of this stereotype there of what's called a herbivore man which is basically like a guy who's not as interested in... Passive. Yeah, very passive, doesn't care about sex and stuff as much. And uh, when you're, you're like, well, that, I, don't, I don't... What would this person be like? And we found out it's a very interesting thing. Like, we would talk to these women who did online dating and, like, and also just their texts and stuff, what they would receive from guys. Like, one woman was like... I was like, so, like, well, what kind of... One thing, their culture is very interesting in how it applies to dating. Like, for example, with online dating... For them, like putting a photo of yourself, like having fun or whatever, would seem very narcissistic. So people don't do that kind of stuff. They don't post those kind of profile photos. So I was like, so what would I was like, so what would a guy post for his profile photo? And she was like, mm, like maybe a picture of his cat or um, maybe a photo of his rice cooker. And I was like, the rice cooker? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> see. <laughs> I don't know how you see your rice cooker, like, ah, this might do the trick. <laughs> what else do you, do you remember from Japan? What was kind of striking for you, Eric? I, what's at the root, root of this, you know, passivity, I guess? Yeah, I mean, so it's a society that's gone through such a major change in, in many ways. And one is the, the role of men has transformed dramatically, right? So it's gone from a, a society where men are expected to be the only breadwinners, to be the leaders of the family, to have real authority, to a society that's becoming more like the United States uh, and other parts of Western Europe where the incredible rise of women, uh, more access to education, more access to good jobs, and real question about gender roles. Uh, and a lot, you know, the sociologists who, who really work on this um, will tell you that that's at the heart of this thing. It's kind of the, the changing role of men, the problems in the economy, and it's just led to real confusion about um, how to date. I mean, historically, uh, the Japanese did a lot of arranged marriages as well, and that's fallen out of favor. So the, the idea about Japan was that you would think that if there was a place on Earth that would solve these problems with technology, Japan would be the place, right? Like, they, everyone's got the latest everything. They, they'd come up with the best new devices, the best sites. 
not happening at all. And I, and I guess like the rice cooker thing was blew our minds, right? Um, but there are so many things like that. And, and for me, what it really became the stand-in for is this, this takeaway for us that we cannot expect technology to solve our problems you know, in, in Japan, but it's also true here. It's not like our capacity to connect with other people and form more intimate bonds is going to be solved by like the next version of Tinder. In the end of the day, you've got to be willing to put yourself on the line with another person face to face. And if you can't do that, nothing's going to happen. Uh, meanwhile, in Argentina. Oh, brother. <laughs> what, what's happening there? Yeah, different I mean, situation. That if it, I think, as we say in the book, if 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 Tokyo is the land of the herbivore man, Buenos Aires might be the home of the carnivorous eating douche monster. <laughs> <laughs> There's some crazy people, crazy the men. Mayor. The mayor of crazy Buenos Aires. Crazy men in, in Buenos Aires. Yeah, it's really pretty insane, some of the stuff that we heard uh, from people in Buenos Aires. Do you, do you want to, what were you going to say about the mayor? Well, I mean, in the middle, so, so I went to Buenos Aires for about a month. Um, and, you know, I, I spent a lot of time there, and there's this just incredibly aggressive, masculine, sexual culture there like the you know you routinely see men just like harassing women to no end um, there's a, like one idea that you heard from a lot of people is like when we did our focus groups the, the men and women would say like well in, in Buenos Aires no doesn't mean no no is just a prelude to yes and the and and you know we expect that women will say no several times to make it clear that they're not really interested um, yeah, the women would uh, agree with that too, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but it just seemed like such a complicated situation, right? And so, you know, it's, it's difficult to, to get an insider's take. Although we had Argentines working for us and translating and explaining their lives, and we were doing focus groups with Argentines. Um, but the expectation was that men would be incredibly aggressive um, all the time. And while I was doing work there, the mayor of Buenos Aires a approved of harassing language towards women in streets saying, you know, that's kind of masculine culture, women really like it, it's not, that's just the way we appreciate women here in Buenos Aires. And like got completely shot down for it. But like imagine Bill de Blasio approving of like <laughs> sexually harassing women, it was just, it was a mind blowing thing. Um, and there the issue was like, dealing with the overaggression for women. And you would like wake up in the morning and walk in the streets and see like people crying on benches. And uh, it, seemed, it seemed pretty brutal there. So maybe too far in that other direction. And, and what are the root, roots of that? I mean, can you guess at them? Or did you, you know, uh, find any satisfying answers? Uh, you know, I think it, uh, there's just like a deep history of that kind of masculinity. Um, and I think everything else I would say would fall into the uh, land of total speculation that mm -hmm. would get me in huge trouble. Uh, <laughs> people had a lot of fun there unless they were um, getting attacked. Uh, we would like to have time for audience questions. Um, so uh, I don't quite know how this works, but I think there um, are microphones in the yes. walkways. Yes, they are. Whoa. There you oh, okay. We can't see you that well, so. Cool. Hi, um, I'm Emily, and I'm from Westchester. And, <laughs> yeah, Westchester. I don't give a shit where you're from. <laughs> I, was, I was actually Anyone asked, else asking a question? You don't need to say what city you're from. It's okay. They no, asked I'm me kidding. To say it. They asked Good to meet me you. Me. Good to meet you, too. <laughs> um, before I ask my question, I just wanted to thank you, because thanks to you and treat yourself, I, oh. actually, <laughs> I actually wrote a call to action speech and performed it to my principal, and I got an A+. Plus, so thank you. It's here. Oh, cool. It's yeah. a lot of backstory before your question. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to talk. I thought <laughs> No, no, I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. Yeah. Sorry. What, what do you want to know? Uh, um, anyway, um, I know you have a girlfriend now, but sure. you've been like an established actor for a long time. Uh -huh. And so before you had a girlfriend, was there ever a concern that, you know, girls just kind of hit on you or liked you f because you're an actor? Um, no. Uh, I mean... <laughs> It, 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 I think that's like a way for people to recognize you and come up to you and say, hey, I like your work. And to me, like, that doesn't bother me because I made the work and I'm proud of it. So if that's something people are attracted to, I don't see that as a downside. I, I, you know, if you're like some like stud dude and someone comes up to you because they like the shape of your face or whatever, it's like, all right, well, you didn't do shit to earn that nose. Uh, 
I've made work that people like, so uh, I, I'll take it. Um, and also, I don't think like there's a difference between someone coming up and like being clearly into like the fame aspect of things, or like asking you like if a girl's like, "Oh my God, you're on that show! Whoa!" I, I might not be into that. Um, <laughs> but my girlfriend, uh, we knew each other before a little bit, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely went out with people that like knew my work, but I never went out with anyone I thought was like kind of using me in any kind of way. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> now get back to Westchester. <laughs> oh. uh, I'm Kayla, and this is Alicia. <laughs> um, your character on Parks and Recreation is like obsessed with technology. Did that like play any part in inspiring you to write your book? Um, no, not really. Uh, I, I think everyone's kind of obsessed with their phone and stuff and feels like they're addicted to it. And, and or, you know, the impetus to write the book was kind of more of my own personal experiences. Um, but, you know, I think when we were writing parks and stuff, uh, that when they were writing that, they definitely drew from, you know, um, our characters, like, you know, our, our real lives a little bit. And I, I always was, I got so frustrated about how I was, I was on my phone all the time, and they probably grabbed a little bit of that for, for the Tom character. Well, how'd you guys ask your questions together, by the way? Why not? Because <laughs> if you did it separately, you could have asked two questions. <laughs> We've been trying to think of questions for like three hours. Now. What? We've been trying to think of questions for like three hours. Now. Whoa. And you asked right away, I was like, no. <laughs> Man. All right. Well, good to meet you guys. Hi, I'm Laura, um, and I'm sorry if this is a little bit of an awkward question. I was oh, brother. <laughs> I was wondering if you guys did any like studies or research on how sexting affects relationships. And how sexting affects relationships. Yeah. That was really interesting. You know, what we, main thing we found is that it's so prevalent, and it's, and it's a big part of a, uh, a lot of people's relationships. And it's, uh, it, it, one thing that was really interesting was how much people said it helped them in um, like long-distance situations. You know, uh, like there's one story, remember there's some story that like, so that was one thing we, we asked people about on Reddit. Reddit was a thing we used for a lot of our research because it was interesting because on Reddit you're anonymous so you could be a little more open than you would be if you're talking to someone in person and people would share kind of more explicit stories and things. And there was one guy who said like, um, yeah, I've been away from my girlfriend for so long and sexting is a big part of what helps us when we're apart. And he told the story, he's like, I was, I was doing this big presentation for work one day and I was really stressed out about it. And then out of the blue, she like texted me a photo of her boobs and um, it made me feel really good before I did my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there was a surprising thing too, which is that married couples are just as likely to sext as, as singles. Like a lot of the things we thought we knew about sexting didn't turn out to be true and it, um, it turns out to be far more prevalent. Um, so, yeah, there's a section in there, for sure. Yeah. Cool. cool, thank you. Yeah. Hi, how's it going? Um, I'm Tess. Hi, Tess. Hi, nice to meet you. This is really cool. Uh -huh. um, so kind of what I've realized, or I've always been of the mind, that there's like many kinds of love and there's many kinds of relationships to have. So within you guys, your all personal relationships, what do you think is like the best love to kind of live? Is there an adjective that you would use to describe the ideal kind of love that you would have? The ideal kind of love yeah. you would have? Oh, I don't know. I mean, in, in the book we talk about, you know, they're, they, when they've done brain scans and everything, they, they kind of define these two types of love, like the passionate love and companionate love. Passionate love being like the crazy love you have, like in the beginning of a relationship and companionate love being kind of um, what it kind of evolves into after that initial euphoria whereas often you kind of settle into a more routine thing and it's not worse, it's just a little bit different and built more on like trust and stability. And um, one thing that was interesting to me about that was I was like, I, I asked the guy that kind of studied this stuff, I was like, well, that seems shitty. Like it seems like the other thing is like the passionate love seems really great. Like the pa companion love, it, it seems like kind of a bummer that the passionate love, that energy can't maintain. And um, he brought up an interesting idea to me that really kind of made me think about it and he was like, well, you know, if, if that's what you want, just that crazy passion, and you just want that over and over again, then yeah, maybe you just have shorter relationships and you don't risk it kind of turning into the companion thing. But that's a different kind of view of life. The other view of life is kind of a more narrative view where, you know, you want that, but then you want to have a more rounded life with a career and, and a partner, and you want a family and all that stuff. And f for that, you need that companion love to kind of keep that going. You know, it, it's like the passion love is kind of like, you know, 
doing drugs or something, you know? And if you're like, oh man, drugs feel great. I'm just gonna like make money and do drugs all the time. It'd be like, all right, well that's a very weird life, you know? And, and when you're in that passionate love, that's kind of like a drug, right? Like, I mean, when you're in that, when you really are really into someone, you can't get shit done. Like you're horrible at everything else. Like you're at work and people are like, hey, Jeff, like, huh? like sorry, I was thinking about Christine. And <laughs> you're not your best person necessarily. So I, I don't think there is kind of a best love. There's different types of love and, 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 I, and I feel like I've experienced a lot of them and, and, and they're all fun in different ways. I think the word adaptable is a good uh, adjective to describe a good love to, a good love to have. Yeah. <laughs> it changes. Yeah. <laughs> you want to say more about that, Daniel? Or? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Hi, I'm Pat. Um, I've grown up in a generation where a relationship isn't real if it's not on Facebook, and everyone gets a comment and see what you're doing. So is that like publicness? of a relationship, like detrimenting relationships overall, that everyone can see everything you're doing all the time? Just the idea of like whenever you're in a relationship, it's posted on. Yeah, it's posted, your pictures, everything. Like I just got engaged, that was on Facebook. So yeah. everyone sees everything you do all the time. You know, one thing that was interesting about that is when we talk to people about breaking up, they're like, it's so hard to break up now because as soon as you break up, the person still, even if you don't see them, you see them on your social media, on your digital life, and they don't leave like what we call phone world. You know, they're there. And so all that shit, like let's say you just got engaged, like let's say she like dumps you tomorrow, right? <laughs> like all that stuff's still there. Like you log on and be like, damn, we got engaged yesterday. <laughs> Now I'm dumped. <laughs> this sucks. <laughs> and then it's on your wall like, ah, we, we're not engaged anymore. And your friend's like, what the fuck happened? <laughs> you have all these photos of you and this person, and that's there. And even if you delete all those photos, you still probably have some of the same friends, and then those photos come up, and you're like, ah, oh, god damn it, I can't escape this person. And it's a weird thing where it's like, even if you separate in your regular life, your digital life is so intertwined, you know, and that's a thing even, you know, I, um, even for relationships that not are broken up, it, it was kind of an interesting thing how the digital world of you and your partner kind of meld. You know, do you want to? Well, we solved the problem though, right? What's that? With the photoshopping. Oh, that yeah, that woman who uh, did that. Yes, there was some woman that we found who like broke up with her boyfriend and was so pissed at all the photos that were still in her timeline or whatever, and so. She just like took all the photos and just photoshopped Beyonce over the guy. <laughs> <laughs> so now it just looks like it's Beyonce with her everywhere when she went to Hawaii or when they had dinner or whatever. So that's, what, that's another strategy. We have a lot of practical advice in the book <laughs> you know, like that. OK, we just have time for two more questions. We're going to do one more on each side. All right. okay. Hi, I'm Jessica. I'm from Detroit um, on Parks. Tom Haverford has a lot of swag, but in real life, though, do you think swag is an important part of modern romance? Do I think swag is a part? <laughs> I, I don't know. Don't take this the wrong way, but that, that's kind of a shitty question, right? I don't know, I don't know what you want me to say about that. <laughs> do I think swag? I mean, swag's kind of a fake word, right? So um, I don't know. I, I mean, do you mean confidence, I guess? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a way to save that. Uh, oh, I appreciate confidence, you. Yeah, comp I don't know. I guess confidence is, you know, it, that I guess I would say it's about, you know, going back to what we were talking about, about uh, being on your screen and being with someone in person. And I think it's about the confidence to kind of just try to get out there and put yourself out there a little bit and not just be on your screen. Yeah. Thanks. All right, cool. <laughs> Whoa, last question. So much Pressure. I, Last I know. question. <laughs> don't fuck this up. Oh my god, no, I'm gonna no. fuck it up. Don't, okay. Don't fuck this up. It's the last question. It's the last you thing anyone's gonna hear about anything. If Never. if you fuck this up, I won't sell any copies of my book. <laughs> oh, I know when it comes out. Anyway, okay, so now that I am like totally thrown off. Hi, I'm Kat. Hey. I will ask the last question. Okay, it's a follow-up. Last point. question. Damn it. <laughs> All right, I can do this. This is the final <laughs> question of the Aziz Ansari <laughs> book con panel. Bring the, the DJs back out. After this question, <laughs> I will answer it. Okay. And the DJ will play the theme song from 2001. And, no, I don't know, he'll play something. 
and we'll, we'll, there'll be like confetti cannons and sparklers <laughs> and a huge fireworks display. So I hope whatever your question is lives up to the plans we have for the end. Okay, you know what, panel. I'm just gonna say Because there's and a go lot of guys from the fire department here. <laughs> um, we bought a fire truck to make sure nothing went wrong with the fireworks display. We, we brought in some guys from, from Disney World that run their whole display. Um, I don't even know if I remember my have, name uh, at this point, let alone my question. The Harlem Globetrotters <laughs> are coming out and they're gonna do a small thing. Uh, and then all three of us will be getting on a jetpack and hovering <laughs> out. So, please, let's make it count. What's the question? Um, okay, so I think my question still is, I'm gonna try and get at this, is a question, a follow-up to before about social media etiquette and dealing with heartbreak. Sure. So, I know people, and I've read some studies um, in college psych classes that people who did make the bold move and deleted an ex or a former lover or hookup buddy, whoever it might be, um, they were able to get over the breakup a little bit faster. Again, that time is all relative, depending on who you are. Yeah. But um, did you find anything in your research about if people were able to do that and if they were able to more successfully move on and how that affected them as a person and their chances for romance in the future? Yeah, I mean, I think it kind of... Uh... <laughs> She killed it. <laughs> Thank God. Did I nail it? That's a good question, yeah. <laughs> um, that is a great question. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it goes back to kind of what we were saying earlier where people talked about how um, it was hard to break up, and, uh, but when they deleted the people from the social media, they wouldn't see them as much and they weren't in their mind as much. But I think, it, like I was saying earlier, the problem is like your lives are so intertwined. If you're dating someone and they break up, they're still friends with some of your friends, and you see their photos on Instagram and everything, and um, it, it just it, it, it just kind of made it hard to put them out of your mind. And you know, people talk about how they would look at old text messages and things like that, and just stare, at, like just sit in the bed, just like staring at old messages and things like that. And it's kind of a weird thing where you know when you're with someone now. Um, you create this kind of digital paper trail of your whole relationship, you know? All the text messages you've ever sent, all the emails you've ever sent, messages, Facebook and everything, and all that's there. And some people even talked about like, oh, I deleted every single text message. And uh, all that stuff is gone. I mean, it's a hard thing to kind of erase this person from your life in, 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 in the kind of, in your phone world as well as your regular world, so. Yeah, I just made me think that there's the flip side of that too, which is what you gain by having that digital record, like the story you tell about. Sure the gift you got? Oh, um, yeah. The, the, the positive side of that, the other side of that, you know, that's really interesting is just, you just have this whole record of your relationship. In the book, I talk about like about a year into our relationship. It was like our year anniversary. My girlfriend got me uh, like this book that just had like every single message we'd sent to each other. And um, in the beginning, um, you just see like our kind of texting back and forth and I just remember exactly what I was thinking and she like kind of wrote down what she was thinking during those moments and it was so crazy to have that record of that and see how things are going and um, yeah, everyone has that now. And um, I remember I went to a wedding and I saw someone was talking about this. They had like old emails like the bride had sent um, talking about the groom saying like, I really like this guy but he doesn't want to fucking give me the time of day. I don't get it. Like, what's the fucking problem? I can't get it. And it was so hilarious because, like, now they're married. Um, <laughs> but it was really funny to see, like, how oblivious we are sometimes. And when you look at those messages uh, and kind of look at what each person's thinking, is you kind of realize what Eric was saying earlier. It's like, oh, you think you're by yourself, and you're like, I don't know what to say, and, ah, oh, God, I'm so nervous. But there's another person on the other end on a different screen, like, ah, I don't know what I'm going to write back. Uh, and so, so we're all kind of in it together. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, Aziz. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, audience. <laughs>